This is the Living Environment Biology New York State Regents Review, part one by Regents Made Simpler of a two-part review. This is to give you a good background of the material for the regions. And then again, the most important thing is to do past region questions. The more you do of past region questions, past regions, the better you'll do in the, on the exam. But this is to give you a good background of the material on the exam. They are the building blocks of our world. They are made up of a proton, neutron, and electron, as we see here. You don't need to really know that. But you have to know there's different atoms. Here are the different atoms here on the periodic table. And based on how many protons there are in the center, you have different types of atoms. You have oxygen atoms. You have carbon atoms. You have chloride atoms. You have sulfur atoms. These atoms will come together and make up different compounds. So you have car uh, C uh, one carbon and two oxygen uh, atoms will make up a CO2 compound, which will be discussed a lot in this course. That is uh, when two or more atoms also referred to, referred to as elements, are bonded together. If you have two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, they combine together to make H2O, which is water. So we'll see all these compounds. We'll discuss them in detail in, throughout the course. But again, the physical world is made up of these atoms, which come together to make up different types of compounds. Now, there are two types of compounds. There are organic compounds, and there are inorganic compounds. Organic compounds are compounds that are made by living things, so uh, things that we put together. They are they, they contain the carbon atom and the hydrogen atom. Again, everything is made up of atoms, and they come together to make up different types of compounds. Now, there are organic compounds, which are made by living things, and they contain both the carbon atom and the hydrogen atom, the C and the H. They contain both. Inorganic compounds, they are not made by living things. So, for instance, something like water, rocks, gases, like CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, they do not, they're not made by living things. They do not contain both C and H. They can contain either a C or an H, but if they contain both, it would be considered an organic compound. So those are the two types of compounds. Now, an organic compound, there are three main groups of organic compounds. Again, these are compounds that are created by living things. So living organisms like us, we create these compounds. They are called organic compounds. Now, there are three main groups. There are carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids slash fats. Carbohydrates, they are made up of glucose. So you have glucose molecules, that is the building blocks of carbohydrates. And they, these glucose molecules, this is a sugar, carbohydrates are sugar, they come together to make up a starch molecule. So again, glucose is the building blocks for carbohydrates. And they make up, they make up these long chains of glucose and that makes starch, which is, this is sugar. Now proteins, proteins are made up of amino acids. Those are proteins that are made up of amino acids. So different types of amino acids, there's really 22 different types, which we'll get more into depth later on. Uh, they make a long strand called a polypeptide and that is a protein. So proteins are made up of amino acids and lipid slash fats, they are the third category and they are made up of fatty acids and glycerol. That makes up lipids slash fats. So those are the three main organic compounds. You'll hear a lot about them, carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids slash fats for biology. Now, the cell, that is the basic unit of all life. So every living being, every organism is either made up of one cell or multiple cells. So living beings, they're referred to as organisms, and they are made up of either one cell or multiple cells. So you have two types of uh, organisms. You have a single cell organism, which is made up of only one cell, and you have a multicellular organism like us, like birds, like plants, like uh, trees, uh, fish, all these things. They're made up of many, many, many cells. So single cell, those are like bacteria. They're only made up of one cell. And multicellular is made up of billions and billions of cells. But the cell is the basic unit of all life. So either a living being can either be made up of one cell or billions and billions of cells. Now the cell itself, there are two main types of cells. You have the animal cell and you have the plant cell. Animal cell is what animals are made up of. We're made up of animal cells. You have giraffes, zebras, you know, fish. They're made up of animal cells. Plant cells, that is vegetation, like trees, grass. They are made up of plant cells. So they have very similar uh, things in common, but they have some things that are different. First, uh, we'll start off with the animal cells. The structures that make up the cell, that are inside of the cell, they are referred to as the organelles. So organelles, those are the structures that make up the cell. So we'll discuss the different organelles of the different cells. So first you have the animal cell. And the animal cell, the organelles, again, are the structures that make up the cell. You first have the nucleus. That is like the brain of the cell. That is the center. And that contains the DNA. So nucleus is the information center of the cell. And that contains the DNA, which we'll go more in depth later on, of how the cell functions is based on the DNA that is inside of the nucleus. You then have the ribosomes. These are these black dots, these dots here. And the ribosomes, they synthesize, that's the word you'll hear. That means make. They make proteins. They put together amino acids to make different proteins, which we'll get to later on as well. Cell membrane that surrounds the cell and allows allows materials to go in and out of the cell. So the cell membrane obviously very important. They're all very important. The cell membrane, basically the bodyguard to allow things to go inside 
and out of the cell. That is the cell membrane. The mitochondria, that is the powerhouse of the cell, that creates the energy for the cell to use. So the cell, we'll see that later on, how the mitochondria will create ATP, create energy for the cell. The cytoplasm, everything is located inside of the cytoplasm. If you go inside of a cell, you're not in empty space. You're in this like jelly-like substance, and that is called the cytoplasm. So everything moves inside the cytoplasm, which would therefore be considered the transport system of the cell. The vacuole uh, is right here, these big, these big circles, and they... They store food and waste. They store extra food and extra waste, like a vacuum. They store extra food and extra waste. That is the animal cell. Now, you also have the plant cell. Now, the plant cell has the same organelles as an animal cell. It has a nucleus. It has a mitochondria. People get mistaken with that. But they have the mitochondria. They have the nucleus. They have the ribosomes. They have other things, the vacuoles, the cytoplasm. But they also have a few things that animal cells do not have. A plant cell has surrounding the plant cell, surrounding the cell membrane. It has something called a cell wall. A cell wall surrounds the cell membrane of a plant cell, and it gives the plant this rigid structure. If you ever touch a leaf, you see it's like very rigid, very tough because of this cell wall that surrounds the cell membrane. It also has a very important organelle. Again, organelle is the structures that make up the cell called chloroplasts. The chloroplasts are these uh, green things here, and they can they that is where photosynthesis will occur. A very important process, which we'll discuss, is how they make glucose, and that is because they have chloroplasts. The chloroplast contains chlorophyll, which gives it its green. Uh, color for the plants. Uh, so chloroplast is in all plant cells. Animal cells do not have chloroplast, so we cannot do photosynthesis. You then also have something called guard cells. This is not an organelle, but this is a special type of cell for plants. These are also referred to as stomates. They have specialized plant cells that are used to control gas and water exchange in plants. So plants will see need water uh, need water and CO2 in order to make glucose. So these guard cells, as we see them here, they open and close to allow uh, water and CO2 to come in. If there's not enough, then it opens up. If there's enough, then it closes up. So that's the guard cells, and that is the different types of organelles. Again, guard cells aren't organelles, but they are a specialized plant cell that allows for the gas and water exchange. Now, as we discussed, there are two types of organisms. There is a single cell organism, and there is the multicellular organism. The single cell is made up of only one cell, so therefore they have to rely only on their organelles to carry out life functions. So they're just one cell, so they rely on their organelles to carry out life functions like the nucleus, the mitochondria. A multicellular organism like us, we are made up of many, many cells. So obviously our cells, they obviously rely on the they obviously rely on the organelles that are inside the cells, but because we're multicellular, our cells will come together to make up different tissues like skin tissue, muscle, muscle tissue, and so on. Those tissues will then come together to make up different types of organs. So like the brain, the kidneys, the lungs. Again, these are all made up of cells, but the tissues, they, the cells come together to make up tissues, which make up organs. The organs all work together to make different organ systems. So you have the respiratory system, digestive system, immune system, and all those different systems work together to make up the organisms. So we rely on the organ systems to carry out life functions. Again, obviously our cells themselves do, do rely on the organelles to carry out life functions, but in multicellular, the whole organism is relying on the organ systems to carry out these life functions for multicellular organisms. Now, no matter what, this is a very important word to know for the region, which is homeostasis. Now homeostasis, this means to maintain a stable internal environment. That's called homeostasis, a very important word, to maintain a stable internal environment. And all organisms, no matter if they're single-celled or multicellular, they're all performing similar life processes in order to maintain homeostasis, which is a stable internal environment. So the single-celled organisms, they have the organelles inside the cells, which again, they're all doing similar things, similar life processes as the multicellular to maintain this homeostasis inside the cell and inside the organism for multicellular. So those, those life processes are nutrition, transport, moving things around, synthesis, making different things inside the cells, inside the organs, growth, uh, the organism growing, excretion, getting rid of waste, and respiration, uh, making ATP, bringing in oxygen, regulation, the control and coordination with the brain and the nucleus. The reproduction is to reproduce them. So those, those are the different life processes that a single cell and multicellular, again, all organisms carry out similar life processes, but in order to maintain that homeostasis inside that organism. Now, all life processes make up an organism metabolism. So when we talk about metabolism, we're talking about the life processes that an organism is doing. That is called its metabolism. Now, also, failure to maintain homeostasis inside an organism results in disease or death. So you, you do see that on the regions. The 
you want to maintain homeostasis. If an organism cannot maintain homeostasis, it will, you know, it has a disease or it could eventually die. Those, they need the, the organic compounds, they also need inorganic compounds, they need minerals. All these things, these are referred to as nutrients, things that the cells use uh, to create the cells, to create the, the structures, the organelles inside the cells in order for it to function for other things as well. So organisms need a lot of different nutrients, all these different materials in order to function. There's two types of nutritious organisms. You have heterotrophs and you have autotrophs. Heterotrophs, we are heterotrophs. We eat food to obtain nutrients. So we do that by the digestive system. Well, with multicellular organisms, single cell, they use just the cell itself. But what they do is you have, let's say you eat a hamburger and that contains carbohydrates, proteins, and fat slash lipids. Your digestive system will break it down into glucose, amino acids, and fatty acids. And then your cells will be able to use those glucose, amino acids, and fatty acids in order to make your own carbs, proteins, and fats. So heterotrophs like us, also fish and some, in fact, some bacteria as well, they they eat food to obtain the nutrients to use for their cells. That's called a heterotroph, and we are heterotrophs. As opposed to autotrophs, they make their own food. They're able to make their own food. We cannot make our own food. We have to eat food in order to obtain the nutrients, those uh, organic compounds and other minerals and other things as well, in order for our cells to use. But autotrophs, like plants, trees, grass, they can make their own food because they have the organelle called chloroplast. And they do this by the process of photosynthesis. So a very important process to know called photosynthesis. And the way photosynthesis, photosynthesis works, like we discussed earlier, is that all plant cells, they have a special organelle that we do not have, that heterotrophs do not have, and that is called the chloroplast. So the autotrophs, the plants, they have this special organelle called a chloroplast. And the chloroplast is able to take in CO2 and water. They take in CO2 from the air, and then water, it rains down. So they pick it up from their roots, the water. And again, the garden cells allow the water and CO2 to come in. And these plants, these plant cells could take in the CO2 and water into the chloroplast. And then the sun's energy will beat down on the plants. So they need the sun in order for this to, to occur. They need sunlight. For, in order for this to occur, you could also have a light bulb as well. And the CO2 and water will then combine together inside the chloroplast with the help of the sun's energy and create glucose. So we eat, we have to eat starch. We have to eat, let's say, a, a burger, a, a bun, and that has starch, and we break that down into glucose. But plants, they make the glucose. They're able to make the glucose inside of their chloroplast. They make glucose, and they also breathe out oxygen. They also breathe out oxygen as well. We breathe in oxygen. We'll see that in a minute. But uh, plant cells are able to create they're able to create glucose uh, in their chloroplast. That is the, that is by photosynthesis. So you'll see if you put a plant in water and you put it underneath sunlight, put it underneath the sunlight, you'll see the water will start to bubble. And these are oxygen bubbles. That is a kind of question they do ask sometimes on the regions. So glucose and oxygen, that is what the plants, uh, what, that is what plants make in the chloroplast. They make glucose and then they breathe out oxygen. And then that will be used by cells to make ATP. Now, again, this is used by all cells. All cells, all plant and animal cells will use the glucose to create energy, create ATP using the glucose and the oxygen as well. And that is by the process of cellular respiration. So there's two very important processes to know for the regions. One is photosynthesis, which, which we just did. And secondly, we now have cellular respiration. Now, again, all cells, plant or animal, they all have mitochondria. Here's the mitochondria. And what happens is, is the mitochondria will take in glucose and oxygen. Again, the glucose was made by the plant cell. So the plant, plant or animal cell will take in the glucose and the oxygen, oxygen that was created. And inside the mitochondria, it will take this glucose and oxygen. And again, the sun's energy was trapped inside of this glucose molecule. So the mitochondria, with the help of oxygen, will break apart this glucose molecule, releasing the energy from the sun and creating ATP, which is energy. Now, all cells need energy in order to function. So therefore, all cells have a lot of these mitochondria floating around. And that, that is able to take in this, the glucose and the oxygen and turn it into ATP energy that we see here. It also, as a byproduct, as a waste product, it also creates CO2 and water as well. And that is taken out of the cell. So you see the cycle, oxygen is breathed out by the plant and then breathed in by us to create uh, with the glucose to make the ATP, the energy. Now, the workers of the body, now how are things broken down and how are things put together inside cells, inside organisms? How are they put together? How are they taken apart? So you have the enzymes, they are the workers of the body. They do digestion, they take things apart and they do synthesis, they put things together. So first they have digestion and enzymes are made of proteins. Enzymes are made of proteins and they are referred to, you'll see them in the regions that will be referred to as organic or biological catalysts. Catalysts because they make 
things occur. They, they, they are the ones that are making all the different processes, all the different chemical processes occur, putting things together and taking things apart. And they're referred to as organic or biological, which means that organic that is made by a living thing, enzymes are made by a living thing, or biological, that is that means that it's a living, uh, created by a living thing. First, you have digestion. So you have something called a substrate. So you could have, let's say, a uh, starch molecule, a polypeptide, or a fatty acid, or <clears throat> fat, fats. And what happens is, is that the enzymes will latch onto these, these substrates and they'll break them down into smaller pieces like glucose or amino acids and so on. And you see here, also you have synthesis as well. They can put things together. They can put the amino acids together to make the different proteins or they put glucose together to make different starch. So that's called synthesis. And you see here also, after every reaction that they do, they always keep their shape. So you see how enzymes, they always keep their shape no matter what. And each enzyme has a specific role based on its shape. So these enzymes will break things apart. Uh, these will put things together based on its shape for that. And they always keep their shape after every single reaction. Also, every enzyme works best at a specific pH and temperature level. pH means how acidic or how basic uh, a certain place is. And temperature means how hot the place is. But every enzyme works best at a specific pH and a specific temperature. That's why our bodies are have a temperature about 97 degrees. If it gets too high or it gets too cold, the enzymes will not be able to function as well. So what happens is that the enzymes could lose their shape if the temperature gets too high or the pH changes from the norm. So enzymes work best at a specific pH and a specific temperature. If the temperature gets too high or the pH changes from the norm, then the enzymes will start to change their shape, which obviously is not good. So that's what happens when someone has a fever their body temperature rises too much, their enzymes cannot function as well because they start to change shape and therefore they cannot function as well. Now, also if it gets too cold, the enzyme activity will slow down. That's why we that's why we freeze in meats because there's enzymes in the meats that are doing stuff. But if we freeze it, the enzymes will enzyme activity will slow down. So if the temperature gets too low, the enzyme activity will slow down. The transport, this is how molecules move. They either move by active or passive transport. So first you have passive transport. That means that molecules are moving from a high concentration to a low concentration. That means that, for instance, if there's not so many molecules inside and there's a lot outside, they will move by passive transport, which is diffusion, which means that the the ones on the outside will move in because of passive transport. If you have a room and it's empty, and then outside the room, the hallway, let's say, was filled with people, people would fall into the empty room passively by diffusion. They would just fall in without any energy. That's called passive fusion. As opposed to active transport, that is when you have low to high concentration, and you have on the outside, there's less, and you have on the inside, there's more. So if the molecules want to get inside, they have to use active transport, and that requires energy. So energy is used for active tra transport. You need ATP for that to occur. That's if the room, let's say, was filled with people and you wanted to get in, you'd have to push your way in. That's called active transport as opposed to passive transport. So for instance, let's say you have this example of triangles trying to enter into the cell. So inside the cell, there are more triangles. There are six triangles here. There are seven triangles. And then on the outside, there's only four. So therefore, that's from low to high. Therefore, that would be an example of active transport. Another example, let's say you had the squares entering the cell. That would be an example of the squares here. The squares there are more on the outside, but there's less on the inside. That would be passive transport because that would be from high to low. So that's going to be active versus passive. It doesn't have to be going into the cell. It could also be going out. For instance, if the triangles were going out of the cell, that would be more inside than there are outside. So they would move by passive transport also. Hey, I'm Donnie Rudansky from Regions Made Simpler, and that is the end of the demo. But if you would like to buy the entire course, which is a two-part course, and only in two hours, you can learn all the material you have to know for the upcoming biology region exam, as well as video explanation with visuals of past region exams. As of now, I have the past two region exams up. I'm planning on putting up a third as well. And that is for only $89. You can get all of that and you can be ready for the upcoming exam. That is less than the price of one tutoring session usually. And for just $89. So I'll show you here what it looks like. So again, you get, again, you get the two part review that goes through the entire material in just two hours, as well as video review and with ex with visuals of the past two region exams as of now. As you see here, it's not just me explaining the questions. I also have visuals from the course to go over each question as well. As you can see here, you can see the video review um, with explanations and visuals of those exams. So if you want to do well on the upcoming exam for just $89, you can go to regentsmadesimpler.com. The link is right here on the bottom right. And click on it to do well on the upcoming exam.